Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to all our attendees. My name is Melanie Girdwood Brunton, and I'm the Exhibitions and Education Coordinator at the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. Uh, we'd hope to host the event in person, um, but we're pleased to host it online to keep everyone safe. The Mississippi Valley Textile Museum is pleased you could attend this closing reception for In the Middle of the World with work by Penny Behrens and Judy Martin, curated by Miranda Bouchard. The experience of installing a textile show versus a show of works on canvas, for example, is in a sense very visceral in that the work resists you to a certain extent. It drapes, pools, wrinkles and folds and insists itself upon you physically and with its own individuality. The textures of fabric and stitch also brush your skin and the works will catch a slight breeze or the air from the ventilation system, gently mocking your best efforts to keep them still. Penny's pieces recalling the fragility of twigs, tall grasses and rolling landscapes hang beautifully at home and in unison with the stone walls of our gallery. Judy's pieces wanted to blanket us in their heavy warmth as we handled them, reminding us of their materiality and original purpose to provide comfort. Miranda, Judy, and Penny have worked on this show for over six years, the last two crucially during the pandemic. One wonders how a long distance relationship works, let alone a creative one, especially one so focused on the warmth and tactility of textiles. Yet when we see Judy Martin and Perry Berenzis work together, it's clear that this is a collaboration that is unified by their common interests and their surroundings, years of friendship, mutual respect and love. I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity to physically experience the work and to have inc been included in the process of installing the show. Here I witnessed the closeness between curator and artists as Miranda, Judy, and Penny were in constant communication, maintaining a dialogue that was both professional and personal. This perception was cemented when Judy arrived from Manitoulin to see the show and upon entering the gallery, immediately wrapped Miranda in a warm embrace. This relationship and the impression of the show are captured by this picture of Judy, in which she's holding the pieces, her arms wrapped round and my heart. And by the excerpt from a poem she included with the show proposal by w. B. Yeats, when my arms wrap round you, I press my heart upon loveliness that has long faded from the world. If you were fortunate enough to have seen the show in person, you'll understand why the museum is thrilled and honored to have had to have been the first to show this new body of work by Judy and Penny and to have worked with such a generous guest curator, Miranda. If you have not seen the show, we hope that you'll have the pleasure of experiencing it when it goes on tour. We wish Penny, Judy, and Miranda all the best with it and the forthcoming release of the show catalog. Thanks very much. And so on to Miranda. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that beautiful introduction um, and for getting us. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to work with you. And hi, everybody who's listening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Miranda Bouchard. I'm an independent curator, arts manager, and community artist. And I'm joining today from Echo Bay, Northern Ontario, on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and Thessalon First Nation. On lands where the Métis have lived for generations, near to the traditional gathering place at the rapids, known as Bawating, at the confluence of Lake Superior and Huron. This is Robinson Huron Treaty Territory and is today home to folks of diverse Indigenous nations. I've had the privilege of living in this beautiful area for most of my life, where my settler ancestors have farmed and forested for at least four generations. 
And every day I work to learn something new about the original people and lands of this place and reflect on my positionality and responsibility here. In making this land acknowledgement, I encourage you to join me in this rich lifelong process of learning and understanding. As Melanie said, for the past several years, I've had the pleasure and the honor of working intergenerationally and across great physical distance with the incredible artists, Judy Martin, based in Chaguinda, Manitoulin Island, and Penny Barons, based in Granville Beach, Nova Scotia, to develop and realize an exhibition of their true works, stitched drawings and sculptures in sizes ranging from the modest to the monumental using naturally dyed fabrics. And we've called this show in the middle of the world. These are photos taken from in the middle of the world at the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum by Almont photographer Paul Latour and myself. The images are organized in such a way that they trace passage through the space, offering a bit of a looped virtual tour. I'm also happy to share that these images will be included as part of a catalog we're producing about the project. We're grateful to the Ontario Arts Council for their support. And we look forward to sharing more about this special commemorative project with you as it unfolds. For the past two and a half months, the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum, the MVTM, has been home to 29 works of Judy's and Penny's, most of which were completed or entirely created during the time that we've worked together. We're grateful to the MVTM and its wonderful staff and volunteer team for their hospitality and for hosting the show and bringing the exhibition into being despite the ongoing global pandemic. And we thank the folks who've attended the show in person too. We're told that more than 500 people have visited. As artists and cultural workers, we know how important it is for holistic well being, particularly in these trying twilight times, to have shining beacons of art and creativity where folks can connect, like museums and galleries out there in the world. It's so important to celebrate and acknowledge these spaces and efforts for supporting self expression, creative fulfillment, and social connectivity. So, thank you, MBTM. And thanks to everyone who's joined and is listening today for holding this online space with us. We've had the pleasure of hearing from friends and folks near and far who visited the gallery and found themselves in the middle of the world this fall, or who've been following the posts that Judy and Penny have been making on their famous blogs. We've been thrilled to hear from several of the museum's staff members about visitors' responses to the show and the works and the words therein. We've missed the opportunity to visit the space and commune with the work and with each other. Our intentions for travel have been interrupted, unfortunately, by circumstances beyond our or anyone's control. But receiving this feedback, seeing folks post their visits and being part of two talks, including this one today, has offered some consolation. While we wish more than anything that we could be together with you today for a tour in the space, we do really appreciate your presence here immensely and hope that the conversation that we host today conjures a warm virtual space for gathering and connecting. I'm sure many who are listening in understand and appreciate the depth of meaning, metaphor, and making that are integrally bound up in extraordinary works of tenderly artist-made materials and meticulous handcrafted details like these ones that you're seeing. Throughout the pandemic, it seems many people have returned to or perhaps connected for the first time to handing processes, a way to find stability, rhythm, pattern, and meditation amidst troubling times. Each of the works in this exhibition speak to and about the inner and outer worlds, these processes of creation, these layers of time and self. Perhaps because of the pandemic, now is one of the best times these works could have been brought together in conversation and connection with each other and with visitors to the show. Throughout our years of working together, the first time the works have been in the same place at the same time is at the MVTM. While we've been working together apart long before the pandemic, Judy and I being based in different parts of Northern Ontario in the region of Algoma, Manitoulin, and Penny being based out on the East Coast in Nova Scotia, we intended to have more visits. 
as artists, and I'm sure many listening can relate, we know that things don't always work to plan. We can say that about the process of us working together. The artist can say that about the making of several of the works in the show. And now that we've seen the exhibition up, in person for Judy and I, and through images for all of us, we're noticing things about these outstanding drawings and sculptures that we hadn't before. Conversations and connections between works and across the gallery space that parallel and complement each other. It reminds me of all the conversations we've had as a working trio across distance and difference, working hard to tie the threads together, working gently in order to notice the common threads emerging organically, but working constantly to bring this exhibition of true works to fruition. I invite you now into a conversation with my colleagues, mentors, and friends, Judy Martin and Penny Behrens. I'll be asking them some questions that will weave together a conversation that's different from the ones that we've had publicly about the work thus far. Our previous talk described the artist's overall process, their inspiration, their draw on rural nature, and how those works connect us to each other. Our talk today looks more specifically at the works in the exhibition through the metaphor of frontiers, the limits of what's known and understood beyond which lies what's unfamiliar and perhaps new. It's an idea that's deeply informed by relationality. These notions of newness and happenstance are particularly exciting in my estimation in the context of speaking with these two well-respected artists about their long-term practices and established ways of working. We'll talk through some of what we anticipated as well as what we've learned through the experience of this exhibition project about the relationships between works in the show, the relationships between us and our relationships to ourselves and our practices. And I look forward to seeing what unknown territory we might walk and talk through together today with all of you. So I'm thrilled now to offer introductions to my conversation partners and collaborators. Penny Behrens was born in Bournemouth, England, and began learning to stitch in the English embroidery tradition, lovingly guided by her mother and grandmothers when she was four years old. Her work reflects events in her life and surroundings, including her interactions with the shores, fields, and coastal woodlands of rural Nova Scotia. Living close to nature has influenced her move to hand stitching on cloth dyed by plants. Her works evolve over several months and sometimes years. Penny holds a city and guilds diploma in embroidery and design from Dundee College in Scotland. And her work has been shown in solo and group exhibitions across Canada and internationally. She's lived in Canada with her husband and son since 1975 and has lived and worked in Granville Beach, Nova Scotia since 2007. Teaching and encouraging others to follow their own stitching paths, including me, has been an important part of Penny's creative life. She now shares her process and sources of inspiration on her blog, Tanglewood Threads. The works that Penny has created for In the Middle of the World reflect her life close to nature, her daily observations of her local landscapes, and changing patterns through the seasons and the years. Judy Martin has been working as an artist in 1981. Her densely stitched textiles have been widely exhibited across Canada as well as the United States, Europe, and Asia. Each piece, measured in feet rather than inches, takes years to complete and often goes through many phases. For 15 years, she has poetically presented her creative process to an international audience through her popular blog, Judy's Journal. She believes that touch is the most effective way to make an emotional connection with another, and the surfaces of her artworks are covered with stitches. She holds an honors BFA from Lakehead University in Ontario and a first class honors BA in embroidered textiles from Middlesex University in the UK. Judy's practice has been supported by the Ontario Arts Council since 1990 and is featured in several recent books, including Slow Stitch by Claire Wellesley Smith, Abstract and Geometric by Martha Seelman, and Art Quilts Unfolding, 50 Years of Innovation, edited by Sandra Sider. She's also a past recipient of Craft Ontario's Mid-Career Award for Excellence. Judy lives and works on Manitoulin Island in Lake Huron, Ontario. 
And before we jump into our conversation, I'm pleased to share the exhibition statement with you. The naturally dyed slow stitch textile works of Judy Martin and Penny Behrens inspires ways of seeing, sensing and reflection that are simultaneously outwards at our surroundings and inwards at the landscapes within us. Martin and Aaron's rendered invisible and touch tangible through the hand stitch marks that accrue map-like across the surfaces of layered fabrics, forming worlds within their works. Martin explores inner immensity, recording and reflecting upon the mutable nature of emotions, thoughts, and dreams. Barron's looks outwards at and to nature, creating work informed by experiences with and within her ever-changing environment. In the middle of the world ushers audiences into the liminal space between earth and air, ground and sky, mind and body, knowing and sensing, static and shift. The earth provides material and metaphor. The world is mother and muse, subject and symbol. It is central to the artist's ways of seeing, making and understanding. Stirred by and searching for both meaning and feeling, the artists commune with and convey the gravity of vulnerability, bravery and humility. These works of stitch, natural fiber and plant-based color speak of the intimacy of human connection that many are seeking out and leaning into amidst these turbulent, socially distanced and tech-driven times of connections to tradition and the environment and the urgency to renew them before it's too late and the importance of knowing and accepting one's location in the world. I'm going to open up a conversation with Penny and Judy revolving around five questions that we have been talking about recently. The first question is about surprise. And I put, I put this question to the artist to consider um, asking, where are the moments of surprise for you in the show? First off, I was really happy to be able to go to the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum in person for the opening day. And I got there the day before the opening day and they let me come in and have a look. And I was, I, I looked up surprise, it also means astonished. So I was astonished to see my name so big <laughs> because the Melanie had made these, um, these signboards for both Penny and I, and both our names were so big and me. Oh my God. So I was, I, I had to burst into tears about that. So thank you very much for that. I, I love that. And um, um, I've been working so hard, you know, to, to do this work and I've been doing it for so long. It was really nice to have that kind of respect. So anyway, that was my first surprise. And then my second, uh, my second thing I want to really talk about was seeing my colleague Penny Barron's work in real life. Oh my goodness, if you get a chance to see her work in real life, it does look good on screen, but when you're right in front of it, the details and the textures and the, the amount of um, processes that she puts the, the threads through and the different ways that she's able to stitch, she has a, a wide repertoire of mark making that is astounding. So I was, I was surprised by how I thought I knew it. You know, I thought I knew her work. I'd seen pictures of it, but I was surprised by how it made me feel. Um, just, I was in love with it. And because Penny's work, I'll just say my work is really, my work is more simple. It's larger, and I I work more. I astonish people because there are, are a lot of stitches. But they're basically very simple stitches and all the same, where pennies are more intricate. So in that way, I think uh, our two works do complement each other because we have this, this large pieces, these large sculptural pieces hanging in, in the gallery where your body has to move around them or it, doesn't, it won't be able to see them. It has to go around the smaller sculptures. It has to go see both sides of the larger ones. It has to back up. And so your moving body is experiencing my work with the body. And you know how when you have a, a shower and you're, you're using your body and, 
and you get good ideas. And um, so I, I think that by walking through with using your body to see my sculptures, you as a viewer, get a good idea. You get an idea about why, what's responding within you. And I, I, at least I think that's what happens. And so our exhibition with Penny's intricate work that slows you right down and my work that makes you move along. And it, it's for the mind and the body and the spirit. So that's my answer for surprise. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Uh, I, my one regret is, of course, that I haven't been able to be there physically to experience it because there is nothing like experiencing textiles in, the, in real life. And um, I think for me the surprise would have been that uh, there is such a flow between um, our two types of work. And um, I, know, I know for sure that I would have been completely overcome entering that lovely space and walking in between those two monumental pieces and wandering around Judy's beautiful work. Because um, um, ever since I met her work way back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, I walked into a gallery and I didn't know Judy at the time and I knew I would love this person. Um, the works just, they were on the wall at that time and they just jumped off at you and wanted to embrace you. And so with this show, you can just walk around. You're not allowed to touch, I suppose, but one could easily want to hug all these pieces. They're just such beautiful emotional pieces. And then from Judy's stuff, you can wander into all these little nooks and crannies and um, they are held up against a wall. Um, which is another horizon, like Judy's work, I always describe it as floating in the air, either above the horizon or just touching the horizon. We talk about horizons a lot in our discussions. But when you get, you can walk into these tiny little rooms and my horizons are much more restricted and, uh, but you get a chance to calm down in those little rooms and to spend time with each piece because that is my intention when I stitch is to draw people in and make them look at the individual marks. It's the mark making um, that I really enjoy. But there is a quietness in those rooms, an intimate encounter with my work. And then you can wander out into the openness of that space again and be enveloped by uh, Judy's huge, magnificent pieces. Thank you both. Penny, what, what is it, um, whether it's your work that you want to connect to or about the works in the show or about the way that you go about making the works or the way that the exhibitions come about uh, that keeps you curious, mm -hmm. that drives your curiosity and keeps you moving forward in your process? Well, for me, it's the process that's important. It's the process that keeps me going. Um, I love surprises and I like um, you taking surprises and um, forcing them to do what I want them to do and vice versa. They sometimes talk to me and I sometimes talk to them. But um, I'm a very undisciplined um, dyer. So every time I stick a plant in a pot and put a bit of fabric in there, I never really remember what it's going to look like when it comes out for, if I've done it before. And so um, the surprise there is always what comes out of the dye pot. And then um, the other thing is... Um, the surprise of, or not the surprise, sorry, the curiosity of taking these traditional embroidery stitches that I have done for so many years and trying to uh, bring them into life in a different way, changing their dimensions, um, changing their textures, and um, trying to make them more, less identifiable actually sometimes. But I, I am always interested in what comes out of the stitches and exploring the possibilities of that. And thirdly, I really um, enjoy the length of time that I have to spend working on these pieces because um, I'm a slow person 
and I like to take my time over things. And when you have fabric in your hands, you for so many weeks, you really get to know it and to um, understand it. And you have to sit there and allow yourself to be open to let it talk to you as well. And that is what fascinates me because it does happen. All of a sudden, you realize, my goodness, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. And, and so you then kind of change direction. Um, I think I have a quote somewhere here by Robert Motherwell that says um, that he'll almost never start with an image. I start with a painting idea, an impulse, and usually that's derived from my own world. And that's basically how I get started, and I like to keep it that way so that I get surprises all the way along in the process because the end product is not so important to me as the process. I would like to talk a little bit about what keeps me curious for my work, and that is, yes, both Penny and I are, are talking about nature and about the... Uh, we both live in rural environments. We have a lot in common. But I, I um, also, and she quoted Robert, Robert Motherwell, so she does the same thing. We look at other art. I, I look at art books a lot. I like to see how people intend to make you feel a certain way. And so I, I study, I study art. And um, uh, two of my favorite artists that I'll talk about right now are Louise Bourgeois and Mark Rothko both of because they intend to express emotion in their work. I do intend that, but I also have to let myself go into this not knowing part that we'll talk about in a minute. I, I, it's very important to me that I don't intend, but I have this, in, you know, it's sort of back and forth. I wanna do this, but I have to also be really open. So in order to keep myself in, um, in line, I use journals. So that's the other thing I wanna mention. I have, a, I have a daily journal practice and I will uh, document who I've been studying with my own artwork and my own, the artists that I study and I also just my daily life and, but also my old journals. I'll, I'll keep myself focused on track with my journals and I, I really rely on, on those. So I just wanted to mention those are two things that I do in my process that I haven't brought up before. I should mention to everybody who's listening that the process of our working together over these years um, always comes back to, to conversation that we have that is driven by curiosity and often driven by questions. And so at fairly regular intervals, we'll have a meeting and I'll throw a bunch of questions at Judy and Penny and they always very generously uh, connect to all of those questions. And something, something that came up in conversation when we were looking at this curi the curiosity question in particular was around the excitement of the unknown. And I think it was something that Penny said about um, not always knowing when she begins, um, what she's up to or where, where the work is going. Um, and that, feeds into the next question that I had wanted to ask, which is this uh, not knowing, but to go on, which is the title of one of Judy's works, which I keep returning to. Um, the, the bravery of not knowing exactly what might happen, but of forging ahead. And to me, that connects to um, vulnerability, uh, which is something that I feel uh, comes up in both Judy and Penny's work and has shaped this next question. How do you engage vulnerability in your work or in your process? And from your perspective, where does it show up and come through in the exhibition in the middle of the world? I believe in vulnerability for both the artist as a person and for the artwork. I. Uh... I put my, my pieces uh, through a life process. First of all, um, um, I might not know everything at the beginning, but I know some things. I'll, I'll start with some things. For example, I'll just talk about one of the pieces. 
um, that's the red cloak. It'll come up again one of these times. It's called Flowers Bloomed. It started off as a really regular reddish blanket and it was just fine the way it was. It was had a little mend on it, but it was, otherwise it, it was a good blanket. And I, I put it for a month in iron water, which is water that's rusty water, and it turned kind of dark burgundy. So already it changed um, just because it had gone through some kind of aging process. It was actually called in the dye world saddened. So I saddened the blanket. And it became to me a, like, a, like a portrait, like a portrait of a woman and um, who is going through things. And, but I, at the moment when I was making it, I had this, this great feeling of, of sadness. And I, I decided that my blanket was also sad. And so I cut holes into her. And I, you know, it was very hard for me to actually do this because it was a mean thing to do, right? But I wanted her to be sad too or something, I don't know. So I'm just, I, those are just two of the processes that I did with this poor old blanket. And and it, it was, I stitched it and then blah, blah, blah. And I thought it was finished. But then this past summer, I threw it in the washing machine, hot water. And I had already stitched it. So it, all those stitches shrunk. And then I had to, you know, fix it, con fix it again by making them hang the right way. And so it became, it became uh, something very different from what it started out at. But so vulnerability is in the work itself. But when she gets there, when she lands in that Mississippi Valley Textile Museum, she's no longer vulnerable. She's strong. You know, you just, you feel that you could be safe with her. And um, so that's how I approach vulnerability. I love that idea of feeling that you could be safe with her. Um, I believe in vulnerability too, but I believe in the artist opening themselves up to vulnerability. I will not um, put my work through the things that Judy puts her works through. Because my first experience with about the second quilt that I made, I was um, uh, appliquing red on a white background and dutifully I washed the thing at the end to uh, pin it out and block it and um, the red of course ran into the background. Um, uh, I was putting it into a show and I uh, handed it over to my husband and said I've got to get rid of this, got to get rid of this and unfortunately my husband would have used, I, I didn't even ask him what he tried to use, I dread to think what he tried to use. But what finally, of course, got rid of it was lemon juice on the grass and laying it out in the sun in the grass. But anyway, that was my experience. So I don't tend to try and do vicious things to my uh, stitchings anymore. I'm a bit reluctant to do that. But I really strongly believe that part of being an artist is to open yourself up to vulnerability. And... Um, especially as stitches we I mean we spend time with this these fabrics and cloths so I really believe there is blood sweat and tears in that in that work as well as emotions and life and experiences and daily walks with dogs and everything like that it's it, you have to be open to exposing yourself and it's a brave thing I feel that sending pieces off out into the world into a show because they are your, your, the children that you have brought up and you're just releasing them into the world. But you have to, at that point, get, you know, say, okay, that's it. You can go out and, and, and live your lives as you wish, sort of thing. But um, no, I would, I would not put my work through what Judy does at all. But then when they have gone through this, this life process, they are they're not vulnerable anymore no they are strong they are they've they've seen it you know there are these strong objects i guess that communicate a strength and a wisdom and so i i feel yeah they've been through the ringer but they don't they they just hold that with like we each hold our own death we all know we're going to die but we hold that with us every day and carry on and so do these guys you know I love the way that you both speak about the works that you make as um, 
survivors of the creative process of your processes, but also um, when you speak about your work, and I've noticed this on several occasions, um, there is a connection to mothering the works. I know motherhood is an important theme for both of you um, across your practices, but you are the mother of these works. Um, and so much of what you feel, uh, strength, creativity, freedom, fear, is channeled into the work and the work is alive. The work is a living entity in and of itself. And so the willingness to be vulnerable that Penny describes um, and, and the knowledge that you need to put yourself out into the world, put these works out into the world um, to be exposed mirrors that, that aspect of parenting, um, the vulnerability of being a parent, um, letting, letting children go out in the world, but also just letting go of some of that control. And that, that works very nicely into the next question I wanted to talk about. It's about bringing something into being and then letting it be, letting it go. So where is the balance, do you think, in your work between polish and gesture? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, this makes me laugh because when, we've, when I first met Miranda, she came to my house with uh, a whole pages of questions and uh, we had long discussions about them. But one of the things was I told her I wanted to become messier, which is not the right word at all. What I should have said is that I wanted to work on balancing the controlled um, stitching with spontaneity and gesture, as she calls it. Because um, I love simple repetition. I love the works of, of people who just, just repeat. And I love that motion of just repeating small things. Um, because I have, um, back in the 60s, I made blocks of just rows of vegetables, all neatly embroidered, and um, uh, they were, they, they now hang um, in, on a wall, they completely cover a wall in my house, and, and that's one of my favourite walls, I just love the repetition, simple repetition, um, but I'm also drawn to uh, the imperfection of repetition and pattern in nature, and so I wanted to combine the two and bring them into uh, bring some kind of balance between the two. Uh, so I, I think in the show you can actually see the progression because the first two pieces I did were what I call the two mighty rocks. <clears throat> and you can see that they are, I'm trying, but they're kind of stitches. Then I went into the three little pieces which are basically little woodland drawings of the messy woods that I'm looking at right now out my window. Um, and uh, in those drawings, you can see that I'm starting to mess up the stitches, try and mix them up and, and, and become more relaxed. And then um, I think throughout the works, I become more and more relaxed and more gestural. Um, and it kind of culminates with the um, the one about the beaver beaver sticks sticking out of the ground. Um, I was I was getting disappointed with the fact that I couldn't become messy because of all that training. But um, so I turned the piece over and started stitching from the back. And that section is in the dark grey um, silk velvet at the bottom of the piece. And uh, that is my favourite section in the whole show. Um, that's basically my goal in life is to be messy. I have a messy house, but I can't do my stitches messy and I battle with that. <laughs> so you're saying that you would rather be messy than polished? Uh, well, I do like playing with the balance of it, with mixing the two, I suppose. So the question says, where's the balance Good. in your work between polish and gesture? I used to teach art and, and I do still make gesture drawings. When I make a sketch, I do a gesture drawing, which is a quick, rough idea. Like it's more of an idea of what you want to make, or it's, if you're doing a figure drawing, it's a gesture of their, of their body shape, right? So 
um, so I, I took the word gesture as being kind of a sketch, right? Um, the first, the first step. And, um, and I, as I said, I use my journals, they also are my sketchbooks, but I use my design wall as if it is a sketchbook. I work with my, my arms to make the circles, how big they're going to be on that uh, big 80 by inch, 80 by inch uh, wall pin wall that I used to, to pin the cloth up on. So it's very rough when I first start out, um, but then it becomes more and more polished as we go along because I don't want to confuse and make my viewer upset or anything. I want them to, to find that this, this work is very engaging and they want to get, they want to see it. It's so, I guess the word is beautiful. I want them to think, oh my gosh, this, this is beautiful and go towards it and and experience something that doesn't look rough but i love the roughness i maybe the balance between hmm, it's a good, hmm. good thing you can sometimes go too far with the, with the polishing i like to change the stitching as i'm going along because i want people to think oh it changed there do you know what i mean thank you both for the generosity that you've shown in talking through these questions with me um, something, something that I have really learned from both of you through this process, um, and I think, I think in my own artistic background as a painter and somebody who, who does a lot of drawing and really gravitates towards those immediate processes and those, those gestural ways of working, um, seeing the way that your work has developed um, and seeing the, these durational processes, um, both of how the work comes together over time, but also how talking about the work changes over time mm -hmm. reminds me that even, even these longer term processes have a lot of immediacy and gesture um, inherent in them. Um, and Penny, you said, you said something too um, when we were talking about this question earlier, and I'll just see if I can encapsulate it because I think that there was a lot of wisdom in here. Um, probably paraphrasing you here, but there's a progression of intentional messiness that comes into the work through kind of an intentional subversion of the processes, um, trying things within the making to foil and confound those patterns that we tend to gravitate mm -hmm. towards, the patterns that bring a lot of comfort, but trying to find ways to work against them to bring an element of gesture and messiness into the work. Mm -hmm. um, intentionally trying to to take a leap put yourself into a position where you have no choice but to to take a leap into the unknown and then having to take measures to make it work to save yourself to save the work mm -hmm. um, and that that brings us really nicely into the last question that I wanted to ask about frontiers. So in thinking about frontiers and in the way that we were talking about about this particular question, we're imagining those thresholds that you step over into the unknown and then try to try to find a way to work within or to work through. And the question I'd like to ask is where are the frontiers in your work? What are those limits of knowing and not knowing? Where are the thresholds of how you work together and how we've worked together on this project, but also your own practices, your own independent ways of looking and thinking and working? What are those boundaries between the places of familiarity and strangeness? And what are the margins between the familiar location of the studio and the wilderness outside? Well, I can, I can just... Um... Just say that uh, we know things and we don't know things. And I, I know myself. I know, I know I have emotions, and I, I know I want to uh, communicate those emotions with my work. But I don't know how the other people are feeling, and I don't know uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I, there's so much that I don't know and um, it, personally and with globally, um, we just have to continue on. 
the way I took this question was to, um, of course, be literal again. And um, I really think there is a kind of a, a dance between when you're creating something, there's a dance between what you're familiar with and what you want to explore. And um, as human beings, we're very, very familiar with cloth, right? As soon as we're born, we're swaddled in it. And when we die, we're wrapped in it. And in between, we're covered in it completely. So it's something that's really familiar to all of us. And I realize that that must be why I uh, use this as a medium. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the familiarity, familiarity with it. I mean, after all, it was probably uh, the second thing you felt when you were born, grabbing onto little bits of fabric. And the other thing for me is the familiarity of stitch. But as soon as I start a new piece, the, it's, it's completely unknown. I don't know where I'm going, like Rotherwell. I just have an idea, a thought, and I like to get started. I'm one of those people that likes to just dive in and, um, and just start stitching and let the piece develop. If I say one more thing about about this knowing and not knowing and and, um, and about being uh, true to our own work and that Penny and I, when we started working together, this is all new work and we didn't know what we were going to make, right? That was mm -hmm. a long time ago, but we had these this boundary that we gave ourselves that we would try and work with natural dyes mm -hmm. and that meant that we would have a palette that basically our our show would be great because we both do hand stitch and we both use this natural palette but other than that i was thinking well we should have maybe seen each other in our studios more we should have talked more we should have shared more but i am kind of glad that we did not because we each went our own way we saw what the other person was doing but we never listened to any advice or took any advice it was just one person another person and then miranda in between sort of and you know what Miranda would say all the time to us I just want to support you you are perfect the way you are basically that's what she told us and and we just kept going so mm -hmm. I I just wanted to say that although I knew Penny I didn't know her you know I didn't know her work I didn't know and I didn't know my own and I don't know if that's the frontier that Miranda was asking us to think about but it is a frontier a deep wilderness a deep wilderness, yes. Step into the unknown. And of course, there's, the physical distance has um, obviously um, made it uh, kind of a, a little bit disappointing experience because we had, we had planned all these lovely uh, studio visits and sharing. But uh, we, you know, we're all so far apart. And, um, and then, you know, we've come together here in Almont in the middle of the world. Oh. Yeah, we, we have managed to cover so much territory um, through the journeys of our conversations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've been working together apart for a very long time. Um, but we have come to a space of, of knowing ourselves and each other and the work um, in such rich ways because of it. Yeah. Through yeah. your guidance, too. I have learned learned so much from both of you. And once again, just, you know, so glad that we have the opportunity to have conversations like this and very thankful to the MBTM for hosting us in a, in a public conversation about this. Um, I saw the question, if I would talk about the cocoon, the hanging pot. Okay, there she is. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Okay, well, I do want to talk about that because that that comes up with vulnerability because the the armature within that hanging pot and also the one on the on the floor, which could also hang if it if you wanted to. Uh, the armature inside is from my own vulnerability when I broke my femur. My femur is spontaneously broken in 2016. And I had to have surgery, emergency surgery, and I had to have, I got an infection, so I had to have an antibiotic pump. So I was feeling really broken. Physically, my body was broken at the time. And 
shortly after that, I was I had already made this commitment with Sophie Edwards. I see that she's in the audience, so that's really nice. With Elemental Festival, to do a performance about walking, and I couldn't walk anymore. So, in I made this performance along the river in Kagawan on Manitoulin Island of broken uh, broken willow branches and broken clover stalks that I wrapped in linen and made footprints along this river because I couldn't do it myself but people who went to the festival could walk because I always do a daily walk it's part of my practice and wasn't able to because of the broken leg and blah 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 I made this thing so then after the after the festival I had all these footprints I suppose and I made the two bundles out of these linen sticks footprints and I thought I'm going to put these into my exhibition with Penny somehow and that's what happened so that's the armature inside it's about my own vulnerability and then about the the wall uh, that I used to wrap it is like a big blanket and like my arms and so it's just very very nurturing taking care of of the brokenness of the world. It all became a huge metaphor. But how to display them, I didn't know how to display them. I made them and I thought, maybe they're just gonna be on the floor in front of one of the larger pieces. And, but then at the last minute I thought, well, I'll, I'll provide these hanging rod things. And was, I really think that Melanie and Miranda, you did an excellent job in deciding to hang one and have the other one yeah. underneath That's it. It looks, it looks great. Thank yeah. you. So I wondered if you could all talk about the role of the freelance or independent curator. How does that work? And where did the initial spark for the show come from? I'll, I'll just say the initial spark, I think, came because Penny and I were in this group of, of artists who would meet every year, either in Nova Scotia or on Manitoulin Island. There was, it started out with six or seven of us. It, it narrowed down to four, but Penny and I were always part of it. And we recognized that we were working similar and we decided to have a show with our journals we both made these big journals and then we just said let's have another show too you know so it was kind of that was the initial spark so judy and i had had uh initially met back in 2008 which seems like so so long ago and yet yesterday yeah and we met um at a regional art show uh, I had just come out of art school and I was fortunate enough during that time to, to share a cabin with Judy and to be able to sit with her um, over the course of the few days that we had at the show. And we were both working on something, but I was watching her stitch and she was telling me about her work. And um, I feel like we, we ended up coming away from that weekend with a pretty strong connection, which we maintained over the course of discussions um, across the years. And then it in 20, was it 2015 or 2016 now? It was 2016, yeah. Um, Judy connected with me because she was going to be meeting um, with a group of wonderful artists at her home that coincided with the Four Elements Elemental Festival. Uh, which I was visiting Manitoulin for, and she asked if I'd if I'd like to to come by and and visit. And um, she and Penny approached me at that point about working with them on this very special exhibition. And of course, I said yes. <laughs> um, and the the project and the way that we've been working together has evolved since then from those early conversations. We, we keep meeting and connecting about the work. Um, we, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the artist's goals and the way that the work is developing and what they see in it. And my role as a, as a curator, as a, a project manager, um, as a collaborator, and I think just as a, as a helper has evolved from there. What it's done is give us the space to just make the work yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. It's, there's a lot to do when you're making an exhibition, you know, as anybody who's tried to curate one would know. It's just, there's so much other stuff. And even while we're, we're, we're just trying, I just thought it was just too much for, for, 
Penny or I or both of us or whatever to do without some assistance assistance because we we wanted to make we were both in our we're both in our 70s you know it's just we don't have that much time we just wanted to get this work out there and um there was Miranda just I thought that she was on the same wavelength she was very supportive and don't you agree Penny she's been a big help for us she's been a huge help and um she has helped uh keep me focused and you've probably realized already that she's an excellent questionnaire person. Uh, <laughs> thumbs up with all these uh, thought-provoking questions. Well, I really I really appreciated them. I was telling them this morning that I think I'm going to go back through all those questions and re-answer them and see how they might have changed over the years we've been together. I, I just want to add to you, um, the, the process has, has meant so much to me. You know, there's been so much growth and so much learning about and understanding um, that's come together about about art, about making art, about thinking about it and caring for it and writing about it and um, connecting with these beautiful women, these mentors has meant absolutely the world to me. Thank you. I think we're really proud of the work. I know I am. I have not worked this size before, and I, at first I thought I wasn't going to do it again, but maybe I will. There are a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, a couple of people who are curious about when the catalog um, will be avail available, <clears throat> and if uh, and where uh, where it can be purchased, mm. or how. Yeah, thanks very much for those questions. Um, we're very excited about this opportunity to create a, a catalog. Um, we are working through it at the moment. Um, the, the exhibition photographs um, we, uh, have, have just been completed. We look forward to receiving those in the coming weeks. Um, we're working to pull together some writing and uh, we are working towards a mid-2022 um, uh, goal of, of bringing this project to completion, but we will be sharing more details about uh, its progress, hopefully on uh, Judy and Penny's blogs and through social media. And as soon as there's news about when and how to acquire the catalog, uh, we will be sharing that too. So hopefully uh, by this time next year, uh, we'll have the opportunity to get it out into the world and into your hands. Thanks very much for your excitement. Also, a couple of questions about touring and where um, the show might end up next. So we are still in the process of putting proposals out into the world or in the middle of the world. Um, and um, we are hoping to, to tour the show uh, to a gallery in, the, in Northwestern Ontario in 2023 um, and to uh, traveled, traveled along uh, to other venues in between. Um, but definitely, if I see that in the chat box that there are some requests specifically for touring it to um, places in particular, if anybody listening um, has any ideas of places where we might send proposals, then please let us know. We'd really like to show it in, in a larger center like Toronto. Um, We've had a lot of people who live in Toronto say, is it coming to Toronto? And we say, well, we'd like that. But so if you have a nice gallery in Toronto that you think could host us. I saw some people mentioning the UK and what was it, Texas and the North and Northeast states. We're, we're definitely aiming at an arc that um, will bridge Ontario and Nova Scotia. So there is a list of galleries that we're approaching um, to create a path between between our spaces um, but of course we'd love to we'd love to share it everywhere somebody's mentioning somewhere the penny art center i'd love to go to the textile museum toronto ontario textile museum somebody is inquiring about uh, whether it's possible to purchase the pieces perhaps after the the tour finishes and how they can go about doing that. If anyone's interested uh, in purchasing the work, then we can 
provide the contact information for the artists and for Miranda. If you contact the, uh, the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum, we'd be happy to give you that contact information. Someone has just asked if either of you weave. I just bought a tiny little, um, you know, one of these little things. I literally just uh, put the warp on today, this morning, as I waited for our meeting. And I've never done it before. I'm going to explore that. I always wanted to be a weaver and uh, thought I was going to go that route, but um, just never ended up doing it. And then I found out that my, my Finnish grandmother was one of the fastest rug weavers in her <laughs> little, little town in Northern Ontario where she immigrated to. And I have her old loom that was a handmade wooden loom, a rug loom. Because you know the Finnish rugs, they're, they're quite beautiful and narrow. And, but no, I've never, um, I've, I've learned how, but I've never, I, once I found the quilting and then the stitching, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I paired away everything else. Mm -hmm. I was actually just gifted a table loom. And so uh, during my next visit to Almont to the textile museum, I'll be bringing that with me and looking for some experts tips and tricks. With, with that then, um, and with great thanks to everybody for listening, I think that we will turn it over to Michael um, for some, some final thoughts and words. I'll introduce myself, Michael Reichley Lancaster, the director and curator of the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. It has been an honor to have guest curator Miranda work with us. It's been a pleasure to work with you and, uh, and, and great comments, questions back and forth. Um, and it's been a great time to work together over, over the last few years. But also I want to thank our installation lead, Melanie Girdwood Bratton, mm -hmm. um, and for leading the team Meg, uh, of assistants, Megan Hendrick, um, Roberta Morantz, Richard Skrovecki, um, for all coming together and working to pull this exhibition together physically in the space mm -hmm. and mirroring it so well in the space. Um, and then also uh, uh, just a note that Matthew Moxley did a wonderful job lighting the exhibition as well. Um, so I just want to say to, to, uh, to our guest curator, thank you. Thank you for pulling these two artists together in an exhibition and showcasing their works together. And also I'm humbled that Penny and Judy created works for our space and they just showed so well, they came together, they were a warm embrace in our space. And again, I love the fact of being able to, like you, you have said, be able to walk around the pieces, enjoy the pieces, embrace the pieces, and they embrace you back. And Judy, I love the way you are pushing your work past a hanging quilt and, and playing with that and taking it and, and maybe even once you've quilted something, then moving it past into something else in a three-dimensional and that play that you're doing with the work is wonderful. And Penny, I love your hand dyed, your organic works and presence and the stitching. And I don't see it as overly controlled. I see a freedom there. I see a, a real um, empowering aspect um, to that work and just the tactility of the work. And, and really when you do see it in person, it's wonderful photograph, but in person, you really see that tactility and that warmth of, of the work. So overall, just again, thank you for the phenomenal installation. And, and the presence that you've created in our space. Thank you to the MVTM and thank you to Penny and Miranda, everybody for supporting me and, you know, and all my family continuing to support me in doing this kind of work. It's really makes me happy. Thank you so much to all our people who came and, and watched us talk. I uh -huh. hope we were interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael and Melanie.